Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing? Let's see. We have quite a few of you on the call. Can you guys hear me? Josie's on the call, Margaret, Miles Johnson. Okay, Miles. Um, it's Friday, yay! Yes, it's Friday. Guys, long time no talk. I know it's been it's been quite some time since we had a, a lecture, um, but we are super, super happy that we have Danielle with us here today to talk about um, the iCard tools. You know, we have a lot that's going on right now with, you know, Wuhan and the coronavirus, and, you know, this is a big deal, and these tools could definitely be useful to your facilities and for our health departments. So I wanted to make sure that we had somebody who's very experienced. Danielle has conducted over 44 ICARs throughout the state of Florida. Um, she was deployed multiple times to respond to outbreaks all throughout the state. So this is really uh, you know, an area of expertise for her. And I also had the pleasure of working with her uh, at the Florida Department of Health in Orange County. Um, we got to work together on outbreaks and ICARs, anything that had to do with HAIs and MDROs. Uh, we were we were a great team and I learned a lot from her and together I feel like we grew a lot in our careers. So I'm very, very happy to have her here to present to y'all today. Um, she's currently doing her PhD in epidemiology at Vanderbilt. So she's very busy. She has a lot of great you know, research that she's doing and she's very, very happy and excited to be able to talk to you guys today. So I'm gonna let her go ahead and take over. And yes, I have missed you all too. Um, and welcome, Danielle, thank you so much. And you can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you, Luz. Um, just before I get started, uh, Luz, I just wanted to let you know I can't see the chat. So for the questions, I have a little bit of pop quiz for everyone. So for the questions, uh, the answers, I'll need you to kind of shout them out for me if you wouldn't mind being my teammate again. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. I hope you all are doing well and uh, thank you for logging in and um, noticing the time change. I do appreciate it. And today I'll be talking to you about the utilization of the ICAR tool um, to assess infection control practices in healthcare settings. And this is so important. And I'm going to go through really the fundamental basics. And there's still so much more we can do with these. So please, if you have questions or um, at the end of the presentation, don't hesitate to email me. I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions you may have. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, so for today's objectives, um, you're going to understand the fundamentals for using infection control assessment tools to help strengthen your facility, or if you're an epidemiologist, help strengthen the facilities that you go to their infection control procedures. And really today's presentation is focusing on the importance of enhancing those fundamentals, which are hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, and environmental cleaning processes. All of these topics are my absolute favorite and I hope you'll be able to um, enjoy the presentation as we go along. It's not progressing. Okay, so background. Uh, first and foremost, why is infection control important? It's really because uh, what we do in public health and as epidemiologists and infection preventionists is we're uh, constantly working to prevent uh, Although despite our best efforts, sometimes we do have these outbreaks and an outbreak really is an increase. This is the formal def, uh, definition from your APIC text. So it's an increase of, over the expected occurrence of an event. So this could be of any type of nature. Outbreaks can happen. They come in many shapes and sizes. They um, do not, they love crossing uh, borders all the time. So they do not have any boundaries as well. Uh, so. Really, first and foremost, we have respiratory outbreaks that can occur within healthcare settings. So that could uh, consist of your influenza uh, viruses, especially because it's respiratory season right now. And then we also have our favorite gastrointestinal illnesses, and that could be your norovirus illnesses as well, or um, Clostridium difficile. And then our favorite, which is the multi-drug resistant organisms, or MDROs, is what I will be referring to, the acronym for the remainder of the presentation. 
so when we have these outbreaks, uh, depending on the type of organism or pathogen, a single case can actually be considered an outbreak. And so it's important that you're really familiar with the nationally notifiable conditions list. Uh, whatever state you may be in, uh, the state's notifiable condition list may change. So it's important that you're constantly staying up to date and you can look on your state's public health um, epidemiology page and you'll easily be able to find the nationally notifiable condition list. Very important that you actually take a look at this because depending on the pathogen, you have a certain time frame to report the certain organisms and pathogens to public health. Uh, so it's important that you're continuing to collaborate with your public health partners because at the end of the day, we all are collaborators and we're here to help each other. And we all have the same end goal in mind is to um, protect the public and, and make our healthcare systems healthier. So make sure that you do take a look at that. And I did provide the link at the bottom of the slide for the nationally notifiable condition list. So more into background, um, I'm gonna focus more on NVRO component of the infection control assessment today. But uh, if you have never heard of the interim guidance for public health response to contain novel or targeted multidrug resistant organisms, I urge you to go to this link and download it and become very familiar with this. It's, it's so important and it prepares you for what happens if any of these tiered organisms ever come about in your facility. And I'm sure you have had one and you may not know it. Um, so it's important that you do really become familiar with this. And it talks about the importance of um, engaging public health partners as well. So in this document, it breaks the multidrug resistant organisms down into three tiers. So um, it actually starts at tier three, which are the um, which are the non-endemic NVROs targeted by a facility or region. So this could be, for instance, for some areas where KPC is, is uh, frequently found or prevalent, uh, this is considered a tier three organism for those areas. Tier two are like your uh, VIM producing Pseudomonas aeruginosa or your mechanism of resistance for NVM or OXA48. And these are multi-drug resistant organisms that are identified in healthcare settings, but they're not regularly identified in the region. And so uh, it amplifies the response a bit. So continuing to build upon tier three response. And then for tier one, these are our novel mechanism resistance or our pan resistant organisms. And they lack the investigative experience and report. So this is like your vancomycin resistant staphylococcus or its um, organism. And, and these are just examples and again, Based on if you're in a rural setting, your tier, a KPC may be a tier two for you versus being a tier three. So um, making sure you understand what's prevalent in, in, in your area is so important. And, and to really understand that is to collaborate with your public health department as well. So getting into our nitty gritty of discussion topic of today is our infection control assessments and response tool. So um, this is on CDC's website. CDC created this tool to really go in and, and evaluate infection control processes. And so health departments typically use this tool um, to help prevent outbreak investigations, or as I did when I was in Florida, I would use them during an outbreak response for MDROs to help guide and understand where the facility gaps are so we could come up with uh, uh, with better recommendations to try to halt transmission quicker. Uh, so this could be a prevention tool or also during an outbreak investigation. It's a really great tool that I'm gonna talk about today. So it does come for all, like a lot of different facility types. So it's available for nursing homes, long-term acute care hospitals, which actually um, corresponds to the same one for the acute care hospital. And then there's also dialysis. So to access those tools, I have provided a link below, um, and you, they do have one based off of the different varying settings, and the questions just change a bit based off of the settings and the type of care that is provided in those settings. So just a quick bird at, a bird's eye view of the ICAR tool itself. So this is kind of what the front page looks like. This, is, this one was taken from the acute care hospital um, ICAR tool but uh, you have your overview and it kind of goes into, it goes into facility demographics uh, about your infection control program and infrastructure and then direct observations. 
And so the domains, as you can see on um, the left-hand side of your screen, for the infection control training and competencies, it goes by section of hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, CAUDIs, CLAPSIs, um, ventilator associated events, injection safety, et cetera. And then on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see there are yes-no questions. And I, I want to make sure that um, I really iterate, because I had a really great mentor who uh, taught me this very early in my career, but uh, a tool itself that are yes-no is only so much um, gives you so much as an answer. And so if you're very honest with yourself or when you're asking these questions, if you're an epidemiologist asking these to a facility themselves, you're not asking it for a response of a yes, no. You're really asking to fully understand the program and the processes themselves. And so we'll get into that a little bit further of how I did that um, at the facilities because that's how you get the more detailed information and you're able to identify those gaps and continue to build upon them because the gap at one facility is not going to be the same as the other. And so, and that's the same with outbreaks. So pathogens, they like to go to different reservoirs or, um, you know, they're transmitted different methods and, and can be multifaceted. So it's important that you really uh, try not to ask things in a yes, no kind of phase. <clears throat> okay, so the bread and butter, today's topics are hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, and environmental cleaning. So first and foremost, before we proceed, I wanted to ask a question that you all should be very familiar with, especially if you've been going to lose this CIC study group, is what is the method of hand hygiene, what method of hand hygiene does CDC recommend as the preferred method in most situations? Is it A, soap and water, B, alcohol-based hand rub, C, water only, or D, just use gloves? <laughs> Just use gloves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come on, my beautiful CIC study group members. I know you guys know this answer. So Danielle, I hope you all. I wish I could see. I wish I could see the comments. You should see the okay. comments right now because let me tell you, the bees are popping off. Just B after B after B after B. All so, right. Well, yes. you all are correct. Um, I really, thought it was, I was laughing at myself when I wrote down the just use gloves and. But this is true. People really do just use gloves or they'll they'll do hand hygiene on top of their gloves. Um, so it's important that we all are are uh, making sure we're all up to par on, on what the CDC recommends for the preferred method. So going forward, um, this is in the I put together hand hygiene and PPE, the administrative section component, because the first section really goes over competency based training. And it, it is very similar across the board for hand hygiene and PPE. And so for competency-based training, when you're asking these questions or when you're, you're doing a self-evaluation of your own facility, you really should be looking at who are we training for hand hygiene and PPE? And are we reaching the staff who go in the room? So it needs to be all healthcare personnel that go into the room along with your ancillary staff. So that contains your case managers. And then you also have your environmental services um, some acute care hospitals will have um, nutritionists come in on iPads and they don't know how to gown up and glove up or they don't know what transmission-based precautions are and they also don't understand um, the importance of hand hygiene. So they're using their iPad and you have to just making sure that they're understanding the importance of these components as well. And so um, really making sure that's all healthcare personnel um, there is interesting if you keep asking and prying for these questions, sometimes contract staff aren't covered uh, or physicians aren't covered on a yearly basis. And so physicians will be provided a hand hygiene training upon hire, but then never again. And so hand hygiene and PPE, you know, if we're not practicing it the right way or we we're very busy and stressed, all of these behaviors can change and wane um, throughout time. And so it's important to continue to reiterate that. And so I kind of went into this a little bit, but when is all this training provided? Is it upon hire or prior to provision of care? And then what is that frequency? Is it at least annually? So the, these are really large components that um, really to make sure you have a strong program that you have solidified. The other most important component is the method. How are these being 
uh, how are you providing these trainings? Because it's, it, it, are you really doing an active training or more passive? So active, are you having return demonstrations or are you having passive where they're watching a video and, and doing it on a um, computer-based system where you know we can click through really quick and take the test at the end and just quickly pass it. So really understanding the differences between the two methods of training there. And then here I kind of touch on this a bit as well is demonstration. This is so important. If I could iterate, um, the most important thing for hand hygiene PPE to make sure that the behavior is, is being practiced is to have return demonstrations and actual observed technique with feedback. And so this is, this is something that I, as the facilities get larger, it's harder to do. But although it doesn't matter how large, I've gone to very, some of the largest hospitals in Florida and they had this. And they've been a very robust program. And they're able to come up with creative ways. And I'll, come, I'll um, talk about those a little bit uh, in the upcoming slides. And then the other component of a competency-based training for these to type um, hand hygiene and personal protective equipment is the retainment of files. And so hospitals, I'm going to tell, or in healthcare facilities in general, as public health coming in, for as epidemiologists coming in to work uh, the outbreak, it's important for us to look at documentation, but we are not regulatory, at least in Florida, we were not. Um, and we're not there to look at every single person name and write you up if you don't have them. That's not our job there. Our job is to make sure that you have a really great training, and how can we help you better that training process? Um, if it, if you know, everyone can always improve, and there's always tech, new techniques out there, and so it's really important that we continue to work together to build those training programs. So, I want to know what is the range of information that individuals retain passive learning that includes lecture, reading, and audio visual? Is it A, 30 to 50%, B, 50 to 75%, C, 5 to 20%, or D, 75 to 90%? Guys, this is off chapter three. Uh, this is part of our education and learning for our CIC uh, test, so. Let's Hopefully use our you've been studying. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see. Let, read them out. Uh, I want to hear. You want to hear? Okay. So we are getting quite a few A's. We have gotten a couple C's sprinkled in. Some B's. So there is definitely uh, quite a range. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and answer. So again, this is the passive versus the active, and I'm going to really re reiterate the importance of this in the next couple of slides. So it's actually C, 5 to 20%. PowerPoint, so today's lecture, you're probably only going to retain 5 to 20% because I'm doing a passive uh, lecture and training. And so lecture, reading, and audiovisual is only five to 20 percent of retainment and so that's what we're getting on our computer-based trainings so if we're not doing a, any subsequent return demonstration people really aren't going to have that become their behavior and so that's the important part of including active as a, a component in a supplementary uh, to your training for both hand hygiene and ppe and, and the reason why it's so important, um, and, and I'll show you in, a, in just a second, is because it goes into your audits and your feedback and, and all components. And so this is the next part of your ICAR form is, is talking about what, are, what, do you, what does the hospital do for their audits and feedback or nursing home or dialysis center. And um, I did kind of make this more based off of a, a nursing home or long-term acute care hospital or a hospital versus hemodialysis, but really seeing what is the method that the audits are being collected on. So when you talk to facilities, a lot of times the promotion that they're promoting to and, and educating their clinicians and their environmental cleaning services is the in and out criteria. So they need to foam in, foam out is something that we always hear. Um, and so that's really what's happening uh, versus the your five moments for hand hygiene. And, 
And this is, I know you've learned this from Luz, um, you know, the five moments for hand hygiene really should happen before touching a patient, before cleaning an aseptic technique, um, after touching a patient, after exposure to a body fluid, and then after touching a patient's surroundings. And this is why it's so important is because when people go in to do multiple procedures, they only think of in and out. So they don't ever wash their hands in between any other procedures. So they may go chart in the room on the computer and then go to the patient and um, administer medication, maybe through a peg tube, and then go back to the computer, type still same gloves, no hand hygiene, nothing, type on that computer in the patient room, and then go and, um, and, and not change the gloves again, and then go into insert antibiotics through maybe a CVC or sorry, a central venous catheter. So understanding five moments for hand hygiene is so important and can really enhance our hand hygiene and prevent a lot of infections if we're using it and everyone is committing it to their behavior. And so that's a component of when you're doing your audit, what is your method of collecting your audits? Are you do only doing in and out? Are, when I would show up to a facility and they would tell me, our hand hygiene rates are 95% and we're in the middle of an outbreak, okay? I had to a lot of times think to myself, there's, there's no way. There. So I had to really pull and understand what their method is and what is their, what is their training like. And so really it was because they're doing in and out and then also only getting three observations per week on one unit or two units, you know, one from each unit. Um, and really that's not representative of your hospital. And so it's important that you're being very honest with yourself for your audits and feedback. And I, I do understand there's, there's limited IPs in hospitals, um, but that's why we'll get to the next part of who collects your audits. Do you have secret shoppers? Uh, do you have hand hygiene and PPE champions? Do you have ID physicians that are helping you? Do you have uh, environmental cleaning staff are really great as well because they're constantly on the floors cleaning the rooms. You can have them as your champions as well. And so training them to help you with hand hygiene audits is also very important. And then also that this kind of goes into the numerator and denominator, but what is your weekly and monthly target goals for hand hygiene and PPE audits. It's important to have these goals because if you're only getting one per, per unit, it's not very representative of what your staff is actually doing. And then feedback. Uh, this is really important as well. And a lot of times people think when we're pointing out something negative about someone, um, they, they take it the wrong way. And so really making sure that when you we do, if, if you as an IP or an epidemiologist is observing a clinician they, or a nurse or CNA or environmental um, services and they ask for feedback and, and you did see them miss an opportunity, it's important to actually provide them feedback and say, you know, you did a really great job. I call it the sandwich approach where, you know, you give them the good and then you give them the bad and then a good point again. So that way they're learning and understanding where the breakdown was. Um, but also some other uh, facilities I'd been to, they also had feedback where they would hand out cards. And every time they would see someone do incorrect hand hygiene, because they didn't want to embarrass them, they would hand them these cards. And on the card, it was, it was really cute because they had a, um, a quote, a different quote on each card of why hand hygiene is so important. And um, it was to let them know, hey, I saw you not wash your hands, but it's important that you do, and here's the reason why. Um, so it can be, you can be very creative with how you provide feedback, but it's important that you do. And then feedback on another scale, besides just the individual component, is really how are you providing feedback to your staff as a whole on your audit? Are you having competitions? Uh, per unit? Are you having, are you providing them rates? Are you giving them presentations on it? Do they know where they stand? And it's important that they understand that because if someone hears your unit is doing hand hygiene at 60%, they're not going to like that. And so it's important that you're actually honest with them and, and find ways to improve that. So methods for audits and direct observations of hand hygiene and PPE is you can do uh, paper and pen, 
or um, we, there's mobile phone applications that are friendly, user friendly. And um, iScrub is what we used in Florida because our phones were uh, iPhones for the government. And so we used iScrub, but there's also one called Speedy Audit. And after I researched it the other day, they have um, they have a speedy audit now introduced it to iPhone. It used to be an Android only um, um, application. So they've they've upped their game a bit, and they have in and out and five moments on there as well, just like iScrub does. So I'm gonna pause for a second and see and kind of get your feedback on uh, what what you use currently for audits. And, and it can be epidemiologist, if you use paper and pen method, or it can be infection preventionist. Um, I'd just like to hear from what you guys are working on if you have any questions about this. Great question, Danielle. So we have some answers coming in. Um, we have a couple who are saying paper and pen. We do secret shoppers. Um, Others are using both paper and a mobile app, which is actually the methods we use here at Celebration as well. We do both paper and um, iScrub. Um, Cheryl is saying they use iScrub, Speedy Audit, paper and pen, and then tracked in rounds. RedCap app, so somebody uses RedCap. Um, but it seems like the majority of everybody is putting down uh, paper and pen and then one is using forms from Microsoft. Okay, so um, that's really great and I like that we have a lot of variety and, and it's important that you have variety. Um, some of the pros to having either both or mobile phone application is that with the mobile phone application, you can send those file, those observations from that day immediately to your email and it goes into an Excel spreadsheet and you can calculate the rate in real time if, once you get back to your computer. Um, so that's good because I feel like sometimes with paper, it can become piled up and then it's, it's not as active and fast. And so um, that's a, a highlight and component to using the mobile phone application. One other thing I noticed is um, when Luz and I would go out, a lot of times they, you know, they look at us and they're like, oh, they're millennials because we're on our phone. But they didn't realize we were actually doing hand hygiene and PPE audits. So we were really blending in, looking like millennials a little bit. And I'm sorry for all of my other millennials. <laughs> um, <laughs> we got to own up to our names sometimes. But it, it did work in our favor in these opportunities because we were able to get really great um, observations and, and go in. So, uh, but, okay. So on to the next component is the supplies. And so this is this is in the administrative section, but it really should also be in your direct, direct observation as well. And I, I cannot preach this enough is, are the supplies accessible for workflow prior to entering and during patient care for staff? And a lot of times, um, a lot of healthcare facilities will say, yes, supplies are accessible. And then we go out on the floors and they have a alcohol-based hand rub dispenser prior to entry, which is great. And then they'll have the alcohol-based hand rub dispenser right next to the door on the way out. So that is good for in and out, but is not good for five moments. And so you're asking someone who's going into a patient room, maybe the patient is in the ICU and is very critical and they're doing a lot of different procedures. So you're asking someone while they're doing procedures to go all the way back over to the door every single time they have to remove their gloves and perform hand hygiene. And so it becomes a disruption in workflow and they're busy. They have a lot of patients. It's not like they have, you know, it, it's not an ideal world all the time where they have uh, one patient to deal with. It, it's not like that all the time. And so it's important that as IPs and as epidemiologists, when we're going out and working outbreaks, or even if we're doing prevention part, is that we're keeping that in mind, is that is are the supplies available for them during their workflow? Because if not, then that is a barrier, and we need to try to talk and discuss in my facility, here is a better location. And then you can implement surveys to your staff. If a, if a, if a um, alcohol-based hand rub dispenser was here, would you be more likely to use it? And, and, and really, you should be doing that and asking them, 
where they would prefer in the room to make their lives a lot easier. And the same goes for PPE. Sometimes gloves are all the way in the bathroom. And so, and that's up by the front of the door sometimes too, or maybe in the back end. Uh, depends on, on the facility and their setup. And so having gloves all the way in there, again, they'd have to remove them, go in the bathroom. Hopefully that would entice them to wash their hands, but then put on another pair of gloves. And again, they're just so busy. So we have to really think about these workflow components of why compliance is the way it is. Here, these are real life pictures from facilities where uh, these are their PPE bins. And, and this is really, when you have transmission-based precautions, this is another added layer and tier of, of, of problems that we typically see is that sometimes there'll be one caddy for the entire hall with PPE. As you can see in the, the left picture, um, you know, they're out of gowns. Um, the middle picture has no gowns, and that was a contact precaution room. Um, and it looks like maybe a box of masks in there. And then the other one is drawers and everything's kind of packaged and things are laying on top. And it's really important that you're making your staff's job easy to comply and, and practice these behaviors. And then the other important component is who is responsible for stocking the, the PPE supplies and alcohol-based hand rub supplies. Because if you go around and ask, sometimes it's environmental services job. And then sometimes it's, if, if the facility has certified nursing assistants, sometimes it's their job. And sometimes it's just really not clear. And so these things do not get stopped. And then we have clinicians, at the end of the day, if someone's you know, needing to be attended to, they're going to go in that room regardless of the PPE. If the PPE is not there, they're just gonna go in because they don't have the supplies or time to go find where the supplies are. So again, it's, this is another component as to why we may have some of these barriers. So before I proceed further to the next um, slide, what is the percentage of alcohol that's required by healthcare facilities to provide to personnel for routine hand antiseptics? 60 to 95%, 10 to 40%, 50 to 60%, or 90 to 100%? Pick the best answer. All righty, let's give you guys a couple more seconds. Don't be shy. It's okay if you're unsure. Yeah, we're all learning, and this might be on your exam, so it's important to know. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Okay, so out of the answers that we have so far, um, the winners are the A's. We have a lot of A's, and then we just have some, some C's and some D's, but mostly A's. I was trying to be a little tricky on this one. Um, so uh, for those of you that put A, you're correct. Um, and this is really important. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough because, I'll just go to the next slide. Um, this is actually a large component of making sure that your products are actually compliant with this. A lot of times you go in, depending on who's ordering these products, they may not know this. And then they're ordering, I, I'm not joking, I could say at least 10 facilities I've been to, they had alcohol-free hand sanitizer. At that point in time, I, I don't know what you should be doing. If, if, if it's alcohol-free and it's not actually being effective, then there's, you're, essentially the, the staff are just, they're not really protected at this point. So making sure that your products have this is very, very important. Um, the other component is that you're following the manufacturer's instructions for use. So certain, I'm not gonna call any brand names out or anything, but there are certain uh, manufacturers who make alcohol-based hand rubs that has a volume requirement. One of them is a, as large as a golf ball size. And so if your staff are not getting a golf ball size and you have that one, um, it's not as, it's not supposed to be as effective. So making sure that you also are adding this into your training as well, because it's important. The other component is dispensing of the proper volume. In the bottom picture, these are also from a facility. This is not dispensing at all. And all of, a lot of their uh, dispensers were like this. You can see underneath the gunk, the buildup. These were not being cleaned. And so this is why it's important that you're having your environmental services staff 
if that's what their responsibility is, is that this, this component is also being cleaned because this can lead to outbreaks uh, and this can lead to large problems in facilities very fast. So it's important that you're keeping these things in mind. If you have the automated ones, those ones as well, they need battery replacement. And sometimes you would see on units, um, there's like three of them without batteries and they're not working. So then people are just not doing hand hygiene because they have to walk all the way over to the other side of the unit to do hand hygiene. And so these are barriers and these are the breakdowns. It's not intentional that people are, are not doing hand hygiene. Um, the other component, cannot stress this enough either, is that the product in, that goes into the dispenser they need to be unit dose inserts. Do not ever have your staff pop off the product, ever, ever, ever. Um, this can lead to outbreaks if it was contaminated. Um, and then now you're having your, your healthcare provider's hands serve as that point source. So it's so important that you're not topping off or even, even just visitors too. You know, visitors are touching things and, and doing hand hygiene. So it's important that you're, you're thinking about these things and not topping off. Also, another component I added in just because I used to hear this a lot as a complaint is that oh, my hands are dry um, if I keep using the alcohol-based hand rub. So um, I don't mean to bring up another component, but you could also to help your healthcare providers and, and all of your staff out of, um, there are lotions that are compatible with the different hand hygiene products. So you can also have those supplied. <clears throat> another component that I forgot to mention is that when you are, um, I, I just lost my memory. Um, oh, I remember. So other things is when you're doing, when you're ordering your products, it's good to try them because some facilities I go to, the product's very nice, it dries uh, nicely, but some of them, either they're really, really greasy, and so that will be a, a complaint from uh, staff members, or one of them I had was so sticky, my hands were glued together, and so staff were not using it. So it's important that you're keeping those things in mind as well when you're doing your ordering. Okay, so for policies and procedures for hand hygiene PPE, <clears throat> the policies need to be current and reflect what you say your program does. A lot of times people would say, uh, we, we of course promote hand, um, alcohol-based hand rubs. That was always, everyone would always say that. Of course we do. Look at their policy, everything in there says hand washing and it's from uh, maybe 1999. So it's important that you're really reflecting the updates that come out in HICPAC guidelines and APIC guidelines, that you're really reflecting these and you're reviewing them on an annual basis. This is so important. The policies also need to have the dates that are implemented and also who's reviewing and revising them. So having these components in is so important. Uh, another component for PPE that also would a lot of times be missing is uh, the order of donning and doffing. So they would just say PPE, uh, contact precautions, droplet precautions, airborne precautions, um, but then not actually have the physical order in them. So uh, really think about how can we make our policy so thorough that if someone needed to look at them, they would know our full process and, and really making sure that your program or the hospital you're attending, um, working at is, is branded. You know, you're really having this this part be so important and thorough in there. So can't stress that enough because this this is the administrative portion, but then it also reflects how the behaviors are happening in the hospital as well. So here are some gaps that I would frequently observe during hand hygiene and PPE during the administrative portion of the ICARs. Uh, just put these together. Um, so, and this is from a poster that um, myself, Danielle Walden and uh, Nikki Dawson put together for, um, CSTE conference last year. And so this was really where we would see a lot of computer-based training for hand hygiene and PPE, along with a lack of access to supplies, lack of return demonstrations, lack of conducting routine audits. And the biggest one was lack of emphasis on my five moments for hand hygiene. So I'm gonna let the data tell itself. I also provided the um, um, tables from that as well. So here's from our, um, five moments for hand hygiene audits that we would conduct. And these are just based off of the different opportunities. 
So before cleaning aseptic procedures, we had an 88%. After touching a patient, you had 74%. Uh, and then you have before touching a patient is 70%. I'm sorry, I'm reading the um, orange dots. And then the gray dots on the sides of the lines represent the minimum and maximum adherence rate. So you see some of them are almost as low as 0%. Uh, so this is uh, really important that we're talking about this. Um, obviously, we have a range of settings, so it's important to look at that. Uh, after touching patient surroundings, so this is leaving the environment. They went in, maybe charted, uh, touched the bedside table, and then left. Um, so not performing hand hygiene. Um, and we have a 50% compliance rate. The same with after body fluid and exposure to risk, another 50%. Um, and, and this is really the in-between part of going from a dirty task, and they need to remove their gloves, perform hand hygiene, don another pair of gloves when they go to that clean task. It's so important that staff understand that. And then here is by um, um, discipline. And uh, we don't have all disciplines represented here uh, as, you know, this is random selection when we're going into do audits, we may not see all the different disciplines throughout the day. So respiratory and environmental services personnel had the lowest hand hygiene and um, personal protective equipment adherence among the disciplines, about 40% uh, and maybe a 58% for respiratory therapists. So it's important that we're focusing by disciplines as well and that we're not only thinking of hand hygiene uh, of doing hand hygiene and PPE training to just as a whole group that we're focusing on the different disciplines and maybe going forward and doing additional um, uh, trainings with them throughout the year to get those those rates up. And this is from Florida, so obviously based off those different states and settings, these can change. So some of the common direct observation gaps for PPE, we saw incorrect donning and docking order. And as I previously mentioned, a lot of times um, it's because too, they weren't in their policies and it was really never in their training products or training guides and things. They, they didn't have this in there. So it's important I provided a resource here. Uh, CDC has a really great sequence of donning and docking that you can provide um, in your policies and, and during your training. Math, these are my pet peeves. Um, so math during respiratory season, um, we have we have different fashion statements. Maybe it needs to be in vogue of 2020 because people wear them as earrings, people will wear them under their chin, they'll wear them to the cafeteria. Um, so mastering respiratory season, we really need to get better at um, with these observation gaps there. And then we had a lack of glove changes and hand hygiene going from a dirty task to clean task, and there's the resource there. And lack of wearing proper PPE for transmission precautions. So another question, what is the proper order in which PPE should be donned for contact precautions? Is it A or B? All righty, let's see what we're working with here. Well, we have the majority putting B. Good. That's fantastic. Uh, that is the right answer. I, I put this slide up because I think it's important. A lot of times our transmission-based precaution signs, and obviously this is a contact precaution sign, and I, I challenge you if you work in a hospital to go look at one uh, or, or nursing home, go look at one of your, your signs today and see which order it's in because a lot of times the contact precaution sign <clears throat> would say hand hygiene, gloves, and gown. And so to someone who doesn't know how to put on PPE and they're reading it, this is how they're going to put it on. They put it on as they see it. And so it's important that if you have that, that's something that's so simple and easy to change. So making sure that you're, you're looking at your different precaution signs and that it applies um, in the proper order in which things should be done. So now my favorite, environmental cleaning. Just a couple more slides left, and then uh, we'll have some questions. <coughs> All right. So environmental clean administrative section is very similar to PPE and hand hygiene. It, again, has that competency-based training and asks about who. So really, a lot of times, um, staff always say, 
our environmental services um, are the ones that get the training. Well, that's great. But all personnel who clean and disinfect patient care areas, including your nurses, your nursing assistants, technicians, environmental services, they also need to understand the importance of contact time and how to properly disinfect things. And so it's important that they also have an environmental clean um, competency training as well. And also, again, when is this provided? So is it provided upon hire or prior to being able to perform environmental cleaning? And the frequency should be done at least annually. And then again, the method, active versus passive. So remember, passive is five to 20% retainment. We have to get in those active components. And I know it takes a lot of work and time, but if we do it throughout the year, uh, it makes our process, it makes our tests when things are due a lot easier at the end of the year. So for demonstration, is are the, um, is the technique that actually physically observed by a trainer and feedback provided? And this is really important as well. And then documentation, again, retainment of files. So for products in use, this is important too, and I urge all of you, if you don't know what products your facility uses, that you start really taking initiative to work with your environmental staff and understand what processes and products are used in your facility because this can really help when outbreaks are happening. So a lot of times um, I've been to facilities and the infection preventionists don't really know what's going on with the environmental services program and their job is probably one of the most important jobs in the hospital or nursing home or hemodialysis clinic. It is so important. They clean up after everyone. And so understanding what they're cleaning um, what they're cleaning with, and it needs to be EPA registered. It cannot be Fabuloso. Um, and also they have the different EPA lists. So if you're looking for a product uh, that kills C. difficile spores, then you need to really be making sure you're looking at EPA list K. And so making sure that your products are going by these guidelines is going to help you tremendously. Another component is making sure that they're following manufacturer's instructions for use. So it's proper dilution, contact times, and proper environmental surfaces. I can't tell you how often, actually almost every single facility, that none of this was followed. And so it's, it's for the uh, contact times or um, proper environmental surfaces. It, it, it would be uh, so frequently that we would see this. And so it's, it's a huge component that <clears throat> all staff are trained the same way and that they understand the importance of these things. Audits, monitoring, and feedback. So again, what is that method of collecting the audits and who does it? And so um, some facilities will do a visual inspection and, and that's going through with a evaluation of cleanliness checklist and they go in the room to see if it's aesthetically pleasing. Audits should really be using any type of bioluminescent um, or fluorescent markers and under, and touching those high touch surfaces, going in and seeing if they had been cleaned or not. For who collects audits, IT really try to get in there and try to do audits as well, because it's important that you understand what's going on in your facility. And same epidemiologists, when you're working outbreaks, GlowGerm or ATP, whatever your uh, government agency can uh, get you is important because you can use it on in your settings and then help paint the picture a little bit better and understand where your gaps are. Every clean and every person cleans differently. So this is important. Again, what is your monthly and weekly target goals? How many observations, how many daily clean rooms do you want to get um, uh, audits on per week? And then how are you providing this feedback through staff? Similar thing, competition, graphs and rates. How are you providing one-on-one -on -one feedback? Do you have environmental cleaning champions? Uh, these do not all have to be environmental services staff. Uh, so making sure you're doing cross training and have people who take ownership and take pride in what they do is so important. I do want to um, mention really fast is that if you do do audits with uh, ATP or fluorescent markers, I recommend that you change up your high touch surfaces every so often because after, especially with glowed, um, like a fluorescent marker, <coughs> once you've done the same uh, high touch surfaces uh, throughout like throughout the subsequent weeks, people are 
you know, we're, we're behavioral learn. So we go and then touch those surfaces and maybe missing other surfaces. So it's important that you're changing the high touch surfaces every so often. All right, so direct observation of terminal and daily clean uh, room cleans. This is also important because it doesn't, it provides you a different level of understanding of what's going on with the daily and terminal cleans than what the ATP or the fluorescent markers are doing. So the fluorescent markers show you, okay, this was not cleaned thoroughly um, and, and it was not white. Well, direct observations actually show you the systematic approach and are we cross-contaminating? Are we, are we going from high to low? Are we starting from one point and working clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, making sure that no items are missed in the room? Uh, and this really includes hand hygiene and PPE in the process. A lot of times, environmental services staff, they will use the same pair of gloves for the entire clean. So they may, depending on the facility, they may start in the bathroom because that might be their method of, of the clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, they may start in the bathroom and then now they're using either the same rag and gloves or they change their rag, but now they're touching other things with those contaminated gloves from the, the commode and the sink drain and now they're spreading it and then going into the patient zone area. So it's important that you watch this uh, because you can really fix a lot of components to your clean. So this is the, the component of the hand hygiene <clears throat> that I was talking about. So five moments for hand hygiene applies to them. Um, and here are the APIC guidelines for hand hygiene during environmental cleaning. So really before gloving and entering a patient room. So a good rule of thumb that I, I used to tell facilities a lot is anytime uh, the environmental services staff member would go to change their cloth, their cleaning cloth, um, and they're back out at their cart, they should be changing their gloves. So they just, so sorry, discard their cloth into their little waste basket area, dock their gloves, perform hand hygiene, don a new pair of gloves, grab a new cloth, and go back into the room to um, work on the next area. Uh, so this is really important, and it, it helps out if you have um, this in your facility because it helps prevent transmission of the organism, horizontal transmission from one surface to the next. Um, they really can help move those organisms around unintentionally. This is another important component. Uh, healthcare rooms are so large, so who is responsible for cleaning what? You would ask facilities this, uh, they don't know. And so it's important that if you work at a facility or if you're epidemiologist working at outbreaks, you find this out. And if uh, for those facilities, those IPs who work at a facility create a discipline framework, and this can include your equipment type, your personnel who are responsible for that equipment, <clears throat> the product, and the contact time. The reason for this uh, is because a lot of times, environmental people assume environmental services are responsible for the entire room. I can't tell you how many times environmental services would never touch the ventilator. Um, they would never touch it, it, all the different equipment. The, the equipment on the end of the bed, um, the circulators, they wouldn't touch those things because they're scared to mess up or accidentally touch a button. So those things are being frequently missed. So it's important that you're including that because um, if not, then it's not ever being cleaned within the room. All right, so again, for the cleaning policies, they need to be current and reflect what your program says it does and then have the dates implemented and the persons who reviewed and revised those policies. Some of, some of your admin uh, environmental cleaning gaps or that you have uh, a lot of times we've seen a lack of competency validation on the cleaning and disinfecting. So <clears throat> I know this, this first part is a, um, a really good reference, actually loose bound. Uh, it's from the Oregon Patient Safety Commission and it's on YouTube and they have it in English and Spanish. It is fantastic. It's a great video for environmental cleaning and the importance of their job. But then here's another resource for return demonstration an environmental cleaning checklist. And so you can use the both of them um, together uh, if, you, if you'd like uh, to help your staff out. I actually would use the um, environmental checklist as well for, for audits. And then for lack of um, conducting routine audits, a lot of times they would be visual, aesthetically pleasing visual assessment, uh, no direct observations being done. So it's important that these, these are uh, conducted so you can understand the systematic approach. 
And then lack of sequence of cleaning and policies. So a lot of times the policies are very ambiguous and they wouldn't <clears throat> have any type of ordering or how the cleanings were supposed to be done. And it was just uh, pretty much a daily clean includes, you know, uh, they need to take out the trash, uh, those types of components, but not the actual fine details. So again, be very thorough in your policies. And then the lack of emphasis on my five moments of hand hygiene. Cannot, um, you know, you really need to work on enhancing and emphasizing these all throughout. Uh, it's everyone's job. It's not just one person's job. All right. So the gaps, I just went over these. The order of the clean access to supplies. Sometimes they have to run all the way down to a basement at the bottom to get access to supplies. So making sure that your environmental services staff have access to supplies and that the the um, routine audits are being conducted. So in conclusion, this is everyone's job. We are a team, uh, both epidemiologists, public health uh, at your government agencies and also in the healthcare facilities, uh, infection preventionists. We are all a team and we have the same goal at the end of the day. And so we really need to work together to make our passion for science infectious. And I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening to me today. And I hope that you learned something today and I'm uh, looking forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Danielle. That was, that was really good. Um, so uh, another thing that I would like to just mention is that there's a lot of great information that Danielle went over and it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to take into consideration for your own facilities. Um, you know, even something as simple as who is collecting my hand hygiene data? Is it only me? Because we've noticed that if it's only the IPs, you're going to have, of course, higher adherence rates. So, so there's so much that we could be improving upon in our facilities. So this is definitely something that you're going to want to look into as far as using the ICAR tools and trying to find um, opportunities for each and every one of your facilities. Also, if you do have an HAI program in your state, um, I know there was for some time, um, the Florida Department of Health was actually reaching out to facilities for ICARs. And here, you know, the Florida Department of Health is not a regulatory agency. So this was really done as, um, as support for facilities to try to help them identify areas to improve. So definitely consider that if you're ever offered, you know, for the health department to come in and take a look. I know it can be a little bit daunting um, and somewhat scary to have somebody else in your house to come and look. Um, but, you know, sometimes that's, that's what's needed and that will give you a different perspective. So if you guys have any questions... Sorry, go ahead. Louise, I just want to touch on that a little bit too, is that uh, like Lou said, it is daunting, but again, we're a team. And so we sometimes, uh, a lot of times we're seeing the same things as IPs are seeing, but it helps having an additional perspective and component and saying the same thing just a little bit differently sometimes gets the actions to happen. And so we help you in that component as well. So don't don't ever be scared to reach out to your health department to conduct ICAR assessments because we really are there to help you. Yes. So I've had a couple of questions come through about, will we be sharing this PowerPoint? Um, is it recorded? So yes, it's recorded. Um, and of course, we have to wait for the system to do its little thing to save the recording. But once the recording is available, I'll send that out. Danielle has also sent me her presentation as a PDF. So I will send that out with the recording. Um, now, we did have a question come through about laptops. So how do you deal with portable laptops and like hand hygiene? What's your hand hygiene guidance around that? That's a fantastic question because um, even that goes in, in with uh, iPads as well. Um, so it's challenging. A lot of times I would see people kind of like cuddle their laptop while they do hand hygiene. Um, it's challenging because it depends on the size of the laptop. Um, iPads are a bit easier to kind of tuck under your arm and do hand hygiene, but I would say um, also making sure that those items, if they're being placed on a bedside table or near a sink or, you know, being used in the room, they need to be wiped down with your, either if you're using PDI wipes or whatever wipes you're using, they need to be wiped down after every room because, again, those can serve as point sources. So, Hand hygiene should not be an excuse just because you have something in your hand, but it does, you know, it, it's going to be facility specific and it's hard sometimes to come up with an idea unless I can physically see it, but it, I have seen the cradling technique 
um, and that has seemed to work. So I don't know if that's possible for your facility, but um, making sure that that is, that is completed. Yeah, and actually, so this is a project that I did in my facility this week. So I did a point prevalence survey um, on Wednesday, and what we did was we had, um, it was me and our infection prevention intern, we had 33 patients on isolation that day, and we went out and we looked at all of the rooms that were on isolation and whether they had the appropriate wipes in the room. So if it's an enteric room, did they have a bleach wipe? And if it's a, you know, droplet room, did they have, um, you know, whatever other wipe you use at your facility? Um, and we found some pretty, you know, we, we found some numbers that were concerning we really didn't have a lot of wipes in the rooms um, and you know this is a concern that has now been brought up to leadership and nursing but you know that could be uh, um, something that you could do at your facility to to see hey do we actually have wipes in the room are we actually adhering to cleaning and disinfection um, so you have different things that you can do to 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 address gaps that you identify with using the icar tool Oh, wow. Okay, we have a long one here. Um, we just implemented a new dietary program, so they are bringing the iPads into the room. I have them setting the iPad on a table outside the room so they can use appropriate hand hygiene and PPE, then take the laptop in. But I'm struggling with how the process should occur for exiting those contact isolation rooms. Yeah, that, it depends on the room um, style, how it's set up, but Really, I don't know if there's a table close by to where they dock their PPE upon exit of the room. Um, it could be, <laughs> that can be very challenging, but I, I would say if there's an area in your facility, um, it's not ideal to place the iPad down, but you know, this is the real life scenario. So they would need to place the iPad down. Um, oh, I got a, I got another idea if this doesn't work. But um, place the iPad down on a little table, remove their PPE, um, perform hand hygiene, put on another pair of gloves, disinfect the iPad, remove, um, you know, tuck that in their, their arm, and then remove their gloves and perform hand hygiene again to exit. Um, another component, too, could be that they, um, they actually remove their gloves after their contact, or so say they did whatever they did in the room uh, and they're upon exit. So they remove their gloves and, and Louis, feel free to pitch in too, but remove their gloves, perform hand hygiene, put a new pair of gloves, grab the, the wipe to clean off the iPad. And if there's something outside the room or a caddy, um, they can they can put it like out right outside the room. Sometimes I would see like the, what is that handrail on the side of the door um, on the wall that they could put it in and then they're like literally reaching their hand out. I mean, it, it becomes challenging, but then they need to, once they do that, um, remove all their PPE, perform hand hygiene, and then exit the room, grab the iPad. It, it, it does become challenging with the, the portable devices. I don't know, Luz, do you have any additional recommendations from your experience? Yeah, so for us, Oh, Heather, she just responded. We have a rolling table that constantly stays outside the room, so they could put it on that. I was going to say, a lot of the times for whenever you have either a laptop or uh, or an iPad, they actually bring a little rolling table with them, and they can have wipes on that. Um, and it makes it easier for them to have access to and to actually clean it. For some of our our rooms in the newer tower, the one that's been remodeled, there's actually a little kind of cubby area where they they keep wipes there outside of the room, so they're able to you know clean off the the equipment that way. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on your facility type and what you can have available. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. I know we went over our time, but, you know, thank you to Danielle and thank you to all of you for staying on and, um, you know, listening to this presentation. Just try to get some ideas and, and I, I encourage you to do an to do an ICAR on your own facility. If you have an issue in your ICU, you have an issue with caudies, clabsies, you're having issues with hand hygiene, know that you're not alone. Um, you know, no facility is perfect. We all struggle. We all have our areas of opportunity. I mean, I've always been very open and honest about that. So, so just know that we are all together in the same boat and trying to help each other out. So, 
Thank you guys. And um, you're getting a lot of great presentation and thank yous, Danielle. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. See y'all next time.